Hello everyone, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on when you're watching this. My name is uh, Kane Linton and uh, I work for Kwansei Gakuin University in Osaka, Japan. And today I'd like to be speaking to you about effective pronunciation drilling for EFL students with a focus on the isolation of accent sounds. So before we get into the main points, I'd like to give you a bit of introduction, uh, my background. Um, I originally come from Australia and uh, prior to coming to Japan I worked with the indigenous communities in uh, central Australia close to Ayers Rock, or well, when I say close, about 300 kilometers west of Ayers Rock. Um, but I've been in Japan for about eight years now and I uh, currently work in a university um, focused on science and technology and uh, one of the main points that we try to to push on our students is uh, effective communication and authentic communication and I think uh, this study really helps with that. Um, originally this study uh, occurred in 2019 and I have since um, done a few follow-ups just to uh, um, review the data and uh, uh, review a few of the assumptions made in this research. So let's begin. Now the problem as I see it um, can be split into three main points. Um, overall, pronunciation difficulties for non-native learners of English may arise when a student encounters sounds in English that are not part of the sound inventory of their native language. So that's the difference between L1 and L2. Um, point number two, when the rules of combining sounds into words in the student's L1 are different from those in English i.e. differing syllable types and that is the crux of the matter. Um, I do talk about how we develop these um, sound rules um, as we um, grow up um, that I'll get into in a bit. And point number three, when the characteristic patterns of stress and intonation are different in English, thus disrupting the overall rhythm of the language, um, i.e. pitch accent versus stress accent and syllable timed versus stress timed. So in the Japanese context uh, it can be broken down to the fact that there are six Japanese vowels as opposed to the 11 in English. And on the right side of the screen you can see the tense vowels in English are those with more muscle tension. And these contrast with lax counterparts. So the tense vowels in English with more muscle tension, as in day, free, shoe, law. Contrasted by the lax counterparts, as in bit, bet, man, book, and buck. Now, the problem is, how are we as educators better able to facilitate student understanding of non-native contrasts? Now, this um, research uh, did lead to some interesting findings. Um, however, before we get into those, I'd like to talk about the solution. Now, EFL students, rather, EFL teachers should not look to eradicate all traces of foreign accent from student speech. Rather, more emphasis should be placed on raising the communicative value of the student's pronunciation, so that what students do produce would be more comprehensible, not only to native speakers, but to non-native speakers as well. Um, if your place of work, whether that's a university or something different, is anything like mine, you would find that a lot of the communication that goes on, not only in students' L1, but in their L2, is with other non-native speakers of English. And that is um, something that is becoming more prevalent as uh, non-native speakers of English become uh, the minority in the uh, English-speaking world. And so that's something we need to be aware of. Now, the first theory I'd like to look at that is underpinning the research um, conducted uh, is the native language magnet theory. Um, and that stems back to what I was talking about earlier on, um, in that our students, as well as everyone else, develops a style of sound map 
and when they are babies by listening to their parents speaking. Um, now, infants categorize sound patterns into a sound map. By six months, an English-speaking infant has heard hundreds of thousands of examples of the E as in daddy and mummy. And native language magnet theory claims babies develop a sound map in their brains that helps them hear the E sound clearly. Babies create perfect examples of sounds with a target area around each sound. These prototypes tune the child's brain to the native language. So it's it's almost a style of threshold. So within a certain threshold, students, uh, children rather, are able to hear these specific sounds. Now the effect of the sound map is to enhance processing of native sounds while hindering the detection of the sounds of a foreign language. Or you could probably argue any language. Um, they're able to discern um, their parents speaking to them in a crowd of many other speakers. And that's essentially what native language magnet theory is. We are tuning our hearing to be able to hear these sounds. Um, this is why children lose the ability to hear non-native contrasts at around one year of age. They essentially remove these contrasts from their um, sound map. Now, the initial neural commitment is subject to reshaping by experience. Enriched exposure, including high variability and exaggerated speech, can change the sound maps of second language learners. So it is possible to um, recode these maps to a degree. Articulatory drilling, or phonemic discrimination drilling, um, refers to the ability to distinguish the vowels and consonants, also known as phonemes, which form the words of a language. For instance, English speakers know that the consonants B and T are part of the English consonant repertoire and that they distinguish words such as boy and toy. Furthermore, in allophonic distribution drills, one of a set of multiple possible spoken sounds or phones or signs used to pronounce a single phoneme in a particular language. For example, in English, T as in stop and the aspirated form as in top are allophones for the phoneme T, while these two are considered to be different phonemes in some languages such as Thai. Now we're moving on to Chomsky's five characteristics of generative phonology. Um, the first three uh, characteristics are relevant to this um, style of sound mapping and overall this, this um, research. Um, but I'll go through all five just to give you an idea of the overall um, benefit of Chomsky's um, characteristics. Now, generative phonology is a component of generative grammar that assigns the correct phonetic representations to utterances in such a way as to reflect a native speaker's uh, internalized grammar and the internalized grammar is essentially the sound map um, that has been enriched through um, years and years of replication and uh, that's kind of where we are as adults um, it's led to this point characteristic number one a non-native student should look to learn and reproduce the physical phenomena of sound reproduction should not be too concerned with the phonetic representations of phones. So essentially showing students um, uh, maybe the phonetic um, diagrams and the um, representations of how to pronounce specific sounds may not as be, well, um, I argue that it's not as beneficial um, as just reproduction of the natural phenomena of um, making those sounds. So replication um, is key. Point number two, the phonetic system is integral to grammar. It is not an independent autonomous structure. So students should be made aware of the interrelated nature of how sound systems and grammar structures relate to create languages. So students should be aware that a certain sound refers to a certain word. Um, especially in English, we do have some quite unique words and they do have quite unique sounds that are attached to them. So students need to be aware of the connection between sounds made and the word meanings themselves. 
Point number three is anti-behaviorism. That is, native speakers of English develop correct pronunciation of languages. Through habitual use, it becomes an unconscious ability of language. And this um, stems back to the sound map that is developed by infants um, over, over a long term habitual use, um, we are able to develop an unconscious ability to discern language sounds in our native language. Um, however, non-native learners and teachers of ESL students should still utilize the stimulus response reinforcement learning mode. Um, so essentially, um, stimulus um, being a, a teacher's um, cue and the response being the response given by the student and then the reinforcement being the teacher either refining or correcting the student's pronunciation. Point number four, um, as I said, point number four and point number five are not um, super related, but for the sake of um, being thorough, we will go through them. So point number four is generative phonology, which also relies greatly on the use of binary phonetic features that is, rather, simply the isolation of the mecha mechanisms of speech into individual states of articulation. So think of it um, when you have a pronunciation diagram um, of the uh, different parts of the mouth and uh, how they are articulated to make sounds. Um, that largely does not have a benefit um, to non-native speakers of English because it is uh, primarily a theoretical approach to pronunciation theory. Um, it doesn't, um, ideally, it doesn't um, provide a lot of benefits over things such as replication. Finally, um, abstractness, um, the actual form of words, i.e. what is the phonetic output. Um, they are derived from theoretical forms through the application of one to several abstract rules. Um, now, abstractness is useless to the second language learner who needs not concern themselves with the theoretical underlying or base phonological forms of language output. Um, essentially, you do not need to learn the abstract rules that govern language, much like in um, for an analogy for anyone that's that knows programming, to learn C++, um, you do not need to learn machine code. Um, in much the same way. Now, um, from these relevant approaches to pronunciation practice, um, we can consider these four solutions. Solution number one, explicit teaching, or at least some type of signal enhancement, is the best way to train EFL learners to perceive difficult L2 phonemes. Um, when we say explicit teaching, um, that means specific and to the point and uh, none of the um, teaching of the theoretical approaches and uh, diagrams and these things. Keeping it simple is best. Point number two, if learners cannot hear the sounds they will not acquire them. That also needs to be authentic exposure to language uh, which um, goes hand in hand with point number three. The target contrast must be made salient through some kind of enhancement that means that you um, ideally overpronounce sounds so students are able to discern the sound patterns and in a way effectively recreate their sound maps um, so they're able to better identify these sounds. And for anyone that's learning a new skill, um, if you overemphasize uh, things, it does make it a lot easier to identify the correct characteristics of something. And point number four is high variability of exposure to differing accent types is an effective way to increase perceptual learning and to ensure that the learning generalizes to novel, never before heard listeners. So if students are able to hear many different speakers of many different accent types of an L2, then they're better able to develop that perceptual awareness and better able to create a sound map of these patterns. Now, we're going to talk about HVPT and HVPT stands for 
high variability phonetic training. Um, now that's what this um, research is about. Uh, this classroom study reported on university aged students' ability to perceive a different vocalic contrast after 14 weeks of high variability phonetic training. Um, now HVPT, as it's known, can be characterized by the following. Uh, it took less than 10 minutes of class time, so essentially you don't need to spend a lot of time on uh, this style of um, pronunciation awareness. Um, one of the um, reservations that my colleagues in the past have uh, raised is that um, pronunciation practice is not really useful in the classroom because it just does not work or it takes too much it takes too much time and I think we've proven um, well as you'll see we've proven that uh, with as little as 10 minutes of practice per class you're able to benefit from these um, underpinning ideals next we utilize the ah uh, ah uh, contrast however the entire vowel inventory was included um, the test was 10 questions, um, five of which were included as uh, distractors. Next, high variance threshold was reached by using differing speakers of the contrasts, primarily through recordings to DVD. Um, as, and as I mentioned earlier, um, having a, a variance of speakers um, helps students to better um, recreate sound maps and um, better identify these sound patterns that they're looking for. Now much of the training took place through uh, communicative activities. Now the, the, the um, communicative activities, uh, anything that you like, um, anything that works for you um, will work um, for HPVT. However, two points, uh, usually overemphasized during the teacher's speech. Um, so the salient aspects of the teacher's speech, the overemphasization of sounds, uh, plays an important role. And uh, error correction became a consistent part of the error correction repertoire. So you need to, you need to be on the ball and you need to be um, aware of um, students' mistakes and students' errors and correct them um, as much as possible. Um, because that's the way that they're able to learn is through consistent um, consistency being key, consistent error correction. Now, just as a review, I've included the four different um, points there uh, for you to go through at your leisure. Now, looking at the results, um, you can see the pre um, and post test and the control and the subject. Now, the, the median score for the pre-test control um, compared to the post-test median for the control was only raised by 0 0.03. Um, as said, there were five, there were ten questions, five of which were control questions. So this score is out of five. Um, so the the control did not really improve over the course of the 14 weeks, whereas the subject group um, in the pre-testing um, comparative to the post-testing made a substantial improvement. Um, therefore, uh, phonemic discrimination was, um, was found. Um, students were able to better identify these phonetic sounds. And the results show that students' ability to recognize different phonemes increased after experience with HVPT. And uh, as you can see, um, that is the key right there. Now, the conclusions that we've made, uh, pronunciation training need not take up a lot of class time. As I said, um, just 10 minutes uh, at the start of a lesson is all it really takes to show um, benefit. HVPT, along with other traditional techniques uh, inserted into classes as time allowed, has an impact on the student's ability to perceive and presumably pronounce difficult English phonemes. Importantly, as, as an example of what students are able to do, the training demonstrated in this study over the course of a semester could turn a group's thank you into thank you, um, which 
<clears throat> I think is is a great benefit and something that um, is achievable. And um, well, I think students would be proud of that. So there's um, a list of the three conclusions of this research once again for your own benefit. Now, the implementation. Utilizing approaches such as HVPT need not take up a large amount of preparation or class time. Just make sure to focus on the following points when considering an approach on how best to include pronunciation forms in your class. Authentic pronunciation practice with high variance. Once again, having different speakers speaking the, the different phonemes that you're trying to um, help students identify. Number two, prioritize form focus instruction in your class. So making sure you're consistent in your corrections. And number three, provide explicit corrective feedback. Okay, and that's the end of my presentation. Um, I'd like to say thank you. And if you do have any questions, uh, there is a question and answer session, as I'm sure you're aware. And I look forward to um, answering, uh, possibly answering and uh, possibly assisting you in the Q&A. So until then, or until next time, uh, thank you very much. And thank you for listening to my presentation.